My name is Preston So, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, and today I want to talk about a topic that I've been working on for several years now. This whole idea of what I call a universal CMS. How many people in here are developers? Okay. How many folks are designers in the room? And how many folks uh, don't touch a CMS from a coding perspective, but touch it from a content perspective? or compliance perspective, or, okay, awesome. So today what I want to do is I want to talk about where we are today in the CMS, and I apologize that the slides are being reused. I didn't have time to redesign the slides, so you'll see that, you know, a little bit of branding from an event that we did before. But I want to talk about what the next generation of CMS looks like, and why it is that we are poised for a very critical inflection point and paradigm shift in content management systems writ large. I want to talk about what's going on right now in the CMS industry. Uh, we've seen this happen in Drupal. We've seen this happen in other ecosystems. We've also seen this happen at .CMS, which is the company that I currently work at. And I want to talk about what Dean Barker uh, at Valtech often calls a race to the middle, which is happening right now in the CMS world. I want to talk about four different aspects of CMS that are really indicative of this trend and really demonstrate that the CMS is headed towards this new phase, this new era of content management. That means universal editing, that means when it comes to developer experiences, that means when it comes to infrastructure and hosting, and of course, when it comes to generative AI, which is of course all the rage right now. So uh, just a quick introduction once again. Uh, you might have seen my books that I've written in the past. I wrote the book on decoupled Drupal uh, way back in the day. I've also written a couple of books about content strategy for situations that are beyond the web. So voice, immersive, spatial content, conversational content. And I've also written uh, the comprehensive guide to Gatsby JS as well, for those of, uh, of you who are interested. Right now, uh, I work at a company called .CMS, and I'll walk through um, exactly what I do there in just a little bit. But if you want to get in touch with me, you can go to my website, Preston.so. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn, you can contact me there, or you can shoot me an email at preston.so at .cms.com, although I cannot guarantee that I will get to that email this year. <laughs> so what do we mean by universal CMS, and why is it that we're talking about this today? Well, in my opinion right now in the CMS industry in general, there's a bit of a myopic dichotomy, a bit of a myopic polarization going on within the CMS world. If you're not headless, you're old, right? If you're not, uh, you know, headless and API first, and you're, you know, doing GraphQL and all this cool stuff, then you're old, right? You're legacy, you're traditional, you're monolithic. By the same token, however, there's this whole idea that, well, headless CMSs, right, are really just for developers, right? The contentfuls of the world, the prismics, the sanities of the world, these are really primarily for developers and not really for anybody else. But the problem is that we have all sorts of people in our back offices, all sorts of people in our companies and in our organizations that do need to touch the CMS. Because here's the thing, what's really interesting about the CMS is that it occupies a very unique ecological niche in the world of software. Unlike a lot of the other three-letter acronyms that we hear about, CRM, for example, or HCM, or ERP, or what have you, the CMS is very unique because the CMS is a center of collaboration between a variety of different personas that have different motivations, different rationales, and different incentive structures. What I mean by that is, it's not just the developer who's touching the CMS. It's also our content editors, our content marketers, brand marketers, everyone who's involved in working in the CMS. Accessibility auditors, right? Compliance reviewers, compliance officials, legal counsel. At the same time, however, we also need to consider the fact that the headless generation has gone in this very interesting direction, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But as a quick summary, what do I mean by universal CMS? This is a quick and dirty summary, and there's a reason why a lot of folks in the CMS world, including in the Drupal ecosystem, have started to adopt this terminology as well. What I mean by universal CMS is, number one, tech agnostic, right? This is the promise that the headless CMS is ostensibly provide. But the problem, of course, with that is you can't be fully tech agnostic without supporting and having an idea of what every single framework in JavaScript wants, right, and needs. Also, omnichannel, right? We've been talking about omnichannel for over a decade now, 
But truly multimodal content is something that is becoming much, much more of a pressing concern today. Just in the last couple of weeks, I've had multiple conversations with some of our biggest customers at .CMS about mobile content editing for mobile applications and for a whole bunch of other types of web renderable approaches that are out there. There's now POCs showing how you can edit content that's destined for a voice bot or a chat bot within your CMS. There's now proofs of concept about how to actually create a 3D interface and administer content, preview content, edit content within that context of a spatial experience as well. Also being stack agnostic, right? The CMS now is something that can be deployed pretty much anywhere. Components of a CMS or ideas of a CMS are no longer rooted in this idea that it has to be hosted on a cloud provider, on AWS, or something like that. Now you've got examples of serverless CMSs. You've also got CMSs now where you're deploying things to very, very unique locations. You might be hosting on Netlify or Vercel, for instance, but that's still part of the CMS, right? All of that is still part of what we consider core CMS functionality. And then finally, AI enabled, right? Universal generation. And there's a lot of interesting companies that are going in this direction right now as well. But the universal CMS at the end of the day is really about restoring the familiar equilibrium of the static web era because we've been undergoing a lot of churn and a lot of tension and a lot of chaos, frankly, within the CMS market. The problem is that there's pendulum swings back and forth, right? With the initial generation of the CMS, we had this really unique compromise that we struck that said, hey, developers, give me a little bit of control over the page and how I can actually visually assemble and manipulate the page. In exchange, you can do whatever you want to within your developer experience as long as you keep my editorial experience intact. The headless CMS and the composable CMS generation really threw that all the way, right? It jettisoned this idea that, no, we do need to have content teams and developer teams in the same room, in the same system, working together. But first, let me just give a quick summary about .CMS. Uh, we call ourselves a universal CMS. Uh, we have quite a lot of amazing customers. Uh, this is our, just a quick and dirty architecture of what we do. Very, very typical, you know, this is all stuff that Acquia and Drupal and, and uh, WordPress have as well. But our customers are really great. Uh, we work with some of the most important uh, companies in the financial sector, in the telco industry, um, you know, a lot of tech companies, a lot of consumer goods as well. Um, and uh, if you know Telus, that's one of the biggest uh, telco companies in Canada, Deutsche Bank, S&P, Vodafone, so on and so forth. Also, uh, we just recently, back in August, had the first ever Universal CMS Summit which was basically a gathering of a whole bunch of companies across both the headless and non-headless segments of the CMS market coming together to talk and discuss what does the future of the CMS hold, right, for the industry writ large. And we were very lucky to count on a lot of really great folks who came and spoke. Uh, we had folks come from Highgraph, Typo3, Crown Peak, Pantheon. It was a really, really great event. And we're gonna do it again. So you'll see it uh, very soon some marketing coming out about, uh, and some information about the Universal CMS Summit that we're having later this year that'll be virtual, as well as next year, uh, we'll be choosing a different location besides uh, Montreal. But let's go back to the CMS briefly and go into a little bit of history, right? So back in 2017, seven years ago, I gave this presentation about why it is that we're having so many struggles when it comes to this discussion of omni-channel and headless and API first. <clears throat> It was a session called Decoupled Site Building, right? How do we accomplish the goals and the objectives and the missions that so many of our marketing users and content users have when it comes to not only the need to administer and preview and edit and assemble all of these web pages, but also beyond the web, uh, 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 you know, in terms of presentation, but also the growth of the number of channels, right? Back in 2017, we knew that the mobile revolution was already done, right? But now we were starting to see a lot more emergence of channels like conversational content, voice content, spatial content, all sorts of other types of content that we now see emerge. But the problem is that in the CMS right now, content teams and developer teams are increasingly being pitted against each other in this headless versus traditional debate, which I consider to be very, very myopic, right? Because here's the thing, content teams have just as complex of workflows as developer teams do, right? It's not just about JavaScript or PHP, 
It's also about how do we actually consider what the preview experience or an editorial experience would look like for somebody who needs to administer an augmented reality overlay, or somebody who needs to serve content out to an iOS application, or serve content out to an Amazon Alexa. And about four years ago, I wrote this article. Uh, I used to be a columnist for CMS Wire, and one of my columns uh, was about why we need a new great compromise in content management systems. And what was interesting about this article is that um, I didn't expect it to, but it was on the top uh, read list. It was the most read article for about four or five weeks on that website. And here's the thing that really struck a lot of people's attention, right, is that there's a lot of stories of people who have gone in this headless direction. How many of you have worked with headless Drupal, by the way, or decoupled Drupal? Quite a, okay, quite a few of you. Now there's this really kind of interesting flood of buyer's remorse stories, of people who went over to Contentful, went over to Sanity, went over to one of these other headless CMSs, and didn't realize that they were losing all sorts of key fundamental functionality that they've counted on for many years. Menu and URL management, for example, navigation management things like preview and approval workflows. And a common thread straddled all these stories, which is that many times, and even still today this happens, people didn't know what they were getting into. They didn't realize, for example, that when you go in the headless direction and you want to do a more modern development approach, you have to rebuild a lot of things from scratch. I just spoke a couple of months ago with a uh, very large enterprise company that had purchased a headless CMS and expected that they were going to get the same exact visual editing, the same exact in-place editing, quick edit-like functionality that Drupal has, but they were handed a statement of work after they bought this product to actually have the, uh, a, an implementation partner build it for them. So this is all really core functionality, and as a result, this company ended up leaving this CMS and went right back to a monolithic or traditional CMS because they didn't want to lose all of that really great in-place editing, visual, preview, all that capability that Drupal and other static web CMSs have had for a long, long time. And now there's a lot of messaging in the market right now where people are really anticipating and also acknowledging this truth, right? Which is that we're engaged in a race to the middle. As you might have seen recently, if you pay attention to the CMS market, you're probably noticing that a lot of these companies and a lot of these vendors are now starting to focus on the marketing user and are now starting to focus on the content user because we are now in a post zerp era where there's no investment happening from VCs, which means that you've got to figure out better value chains that are a lot more comprehensive as opposed to just one-offs like many of the headless CMSs have focused on. Dean Barker calls this a race to the middle. Many of the headless CMSs, for example, are building what are called studios these features that are essentially visual editors for headless front ends. They're also starting to market differently as well. React Bricks, for example, is a React headless CMS that just a few months ago changed their entire tagline to become not a React headless CMS, but a React headless CMS with visual editing. <laughs> so as you can see, we're just relitigating the same stuff over and over again. The headless CMSs have now realized that, you know, it's, it's not enough. You've got to have more. And Dominique Pintel of Kentico, uh, CEO, a uh, good friend of mine, said, you know, as a market, we've learned that headless is not the right answer for everything. But it was still progress, right? It was still good insight and good innovation for us. And Dries Beitart, of course, of uh, Acquia and Drupal, has also mentioned, uh, you know, kind of in conjunction with this Jamstack trend, that a lot of these Jamstack CMSs, headless CMSs, are beginning to add more and more traditional CMS features, which means that they're not really so different from us after all. And Dominique de Coleman of DropSolid says that they have to redo everything, right? Very interesting. And now you see the studios emerging from Contentful, from HiGraph, from Sanity, and also from folks like uh, View Storefront, which is now known as Alakai, really talking about why it is that we're seeing so much weakness in terms of the headless CMS market. Greg Dunlop as well, a good friend of mine who uh, was formerly at Wallaby, uh, said this quote, which I think is a really, really important statement, which is that architectural purity does not trump reality, right? The reality is, yes, headless CMSs might be more architecturally pure. They might be more, let's say, prescriptive in terms of how things should be built, but that doesn't reflect the reality of the fact that people at the core of the CMS are not able to do their best work, right? And that's the whole reason why we see so much 
resilience and so much strength continuing from folks like Drupal and other CMS ecosystems. But architectural purity doesn't trump reality because here's the fact of the matter, right? The CMS fundamentally is really about people, is really about bringing people together and allowing them to collaborate in rich ways that they could never have done in any other system. And that's why this, this notion of architectural purity, where headless has to be built this exact way and implemented this exact way, doesn't really make a lot of sense for those of us who use CMSs on a daily basis. And so what we're seeing is that the historic static web CMS, right, that initial generation, movable type, expression engine, right, uh, late 90s, you know, sort of mid 90s, that time frame, really found this amazing balance, this equilibrium between the ability for developers to control and manipulate all sorts of things, and also for editors to be able to do the same thing as well. With the headless CMS, the advent of the headless CMS generation, what we're seeing is now this, this bifurcation, right? This split, this schism emerging in the market where, you know, CMSs like Drupal, which are called hybrid headless CMSs or traditional CMSs, they're really great for editors, but developers, especially those who work in JavaScript, really don't like working with PHP template or Twig or what have you, right? But on the flip side, the headless CMSs have decided that, you know what, we're gonna make things really great for developers, but you know, preview, approval workflows, editorial workflows, all that kind of stuff can just kind of go away, right? That can just go back to the, back to the devs. But as Greg said, right, architectural purity doesn't trump reality. And what we're seeing now is, over the course of the past few years, we're seeing a convergence in the market, a reconvergence, convergent evolution, where this bifurcation is now going away. Now there is not going to be as much of a distinction between headless versus monolithic. It's just going to be a new version of the CMS. Because here's the thing, in just a few short years, in three to five years, the feature sets are going to start to look really indistinguishable. Where Contentful is going to start to look a lot more like Drupal where WordPress is gonna to start to look a lot more like Sanity, and vice versa. What does this mean, though, and where are people starting? Well, the first place that people are starting is headless visual editing on both sides of the spectrum, right? We're talking about both the headless and the, high, and the monolithic CMSs working very, very aggressively to implement headless visual editing across a variety of different front ends, across a variety of different approaches, or just one, in the case of folks like uh, React Bricks. <clears throat> But also, you see now that there are certain things that are happening where the hybrid headless CMS segment, Drupal, Acquia, you know, WordPress, so on and so forth, are beginning to recognize that they need to get on board with the new developer experiences of today. That means JavaScript, TypeScript, React, APIs, SDKs, sample code. And at the same time, those on the other side are saying, yes, that's true, we need to do everything in our power to create a better editorial experience as well. So what you're gonna see is that in a few short years, the universal CMS is going to become the new paradigm of CMS, which is gonna restore this equilibrium, restore this balance, and essentially it's gonna reflect the CMS as it's gonna look in just a few years, which is headless first, you know, it's gonna have APIs, it's gonna be great for a preview, great for approval, great for everything that we have today, but there's not really gonna be much of a distinction between those architectural types. And you can even see this right now where, hey, this purity, this notion of headless CMSs have to be entirely decoupled and not have any sort of influence over how content is presented. Well, that's changing already because of all the headless visual editing features that people are starting to build. So here's some of the core ideas of the universal CMS. And it's very interesting because a lot of folks have really jumped onto this uh, paradigm and this idea. Uh, I've, been spoke, you know, I've been speaking with both uh, headless CMSs and also monolithic CMSs about this quite a bit over the past few months. What I mean by a universal CMS is that developer teams should be able to bring any stack, any tech, any framework, right? React, Vue, PHP, Laravel, Symfony, right? Rails, <laughs> if you want. But they should be able to bring anything that they want to to a CMS and just have it work out of the box. Tech agnostic, framework agnostic. Secondly, <clears throat> content teams should be able to generate pretty much anything in the CMS. And I'm not just talking about what we see today in terms of generative AI with asset generation or text generation. I'm talking about things that are going well beyond that. Things like, for example, component generation or CMS UI generation entirely based on what's, you know, what's already in the CMS, but can also create, for example, bespoke CMS UIs or bespoke workflows that might only be relevant to a particular subset of users. 
Content teams also should be able to edit and serve anything anywhere. And what I mean by that is within the CMS, you should be able to edit any piece of content that's headed to any destination in a web renderable way, right? That means React Native, Flutter. It means WebXR, WebAssembly, for example. Some of these really interesting emerging approaches that we see now in the browser that also make the CMS much richer as well. And then finally, developer teams should be able to use any infrastructure to host their stack, right? This should be, for example, you should be able to host it in cloud, you should be able to host it in an on-prem environment, you should be able to host it, for example, serverlessly if you want to, in certain situations. But also, we have to get out of our heads this idea that you know, this, the CMS and its infrastructure is wholly dependent on or wholly reliant on one single location, right? Because our SDKs are going to Netlify. Our APIs might be going somewhere else. There might be an you know, API gateway. So infrastructurally, we need to broaden our mindset quite a bit as well as to what things mean in, in terms of the CMS. But why do I call it universal? Why is it that I've latched onto this term and not a different term, right? Well, here's the thing. Let's go back, way back in history to the whole reason why the CMS exists in its architectural form in the first place. Way back in the day, in the early 90s uh, and the late 90s, this is pretty much how we built websites with a CMS, right? You would have um, static HTML files, static CSS files, static JavaScript files that would all get served out to the browser. But of course, here's what happened is universal JavaScript happened, right? Around uh, the early 2010s, you saw Node.js get invented and this whole idea of universal JavaScript. But what's interesting here is that this violated a fundamental separation of concerns that existed within the CMS and also existed within web development writ large, which is, of course, the server versus client divide. Universal JavaScript said, hey, why do we need to manage our JavaScript code in both the server and the client? Why can't we just manage shared code that straddles both of those and makes it a lot easier for us to maintain our code, makes it a lot easier for us to manage all of this code? What we see, of course, is that the headless CMS generation latched onto this, right? They said, yes, we agree with this, we're super into this, um, and that means now everything in JavaScript goes over to the presentation layer, and guess what? Now the CMS has absolutely no insight or no input into how content gets presented. And the headless CMS, by doing so, really instated this separation of concerns from an architectural perspective that said, hey, you who work with content, right? All of you editors, all of you marketers, you're just gonna be data enterers. You know, you're just gonna be data enterers now at this point. You're just gonna enter some data, enter some content, but everything else goes to developers. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's also a different separation of concerns that exists, right? We talk a lot about architectural separations of concerns, and this is one of the big reasons why headless CMS has emerged in the first place, right? Client versus server, markup versus style, content as data versus content as presentation. But the problem is that this elides and this ignores a very subtle functional separation of concerns that exists outside of the context of technical architecture diagrams, but do exist within the context of our organizations, right? What we see with headless CMS, and also CMS in general, is this functional separation between content teams and technical teams, content teams and developer teams. And of course, what happens is that content teams are feeling increasingly pitted against developer teams, creating a functional separation of concerns that is very different from the architectural separation of concerns that we see with headless CMS. The emergence of the headless CMS led to so many of these concerns that were formerly the fodder and formerly the, uh, uh, you know, the work of marketers and editors and compliance auditors and accessibility reviewers and designers and so on and so forth, they lost all of that ability to do preview, approval, workflows, visual building, templates, layouts, and of course, looking at things like compliance and accessibility as well. But as you can see, this whole idea of saying, well, content as data is different from content as presentation, really says to these organizations that the functional separation of concerns that we are now instating is something that doesn't really matter, right? But here's the thing, the universal CMS needs to have a sense of shared concerns across both marketing organizations and content organizations and developer organizations, which means that there are certain functional concerns that have to become cross-functional. We have to stop thinking about content as just data. We have to stop thinking about content as just 
data that you can just put in and you know articles and tags and categories. No, content is about presentation too. Content is about how you actually demonstrate that content for a variety of different front ends, a variety of different presentation layers, and also how it works for both editors and developers. So cross-functional concerns really become this new generation of the CMS, right? The universal CMS says, well, just like universal JavaScript did, right? Developers were tired of how inconvenient and rough it was to build JavaScript across both client and server. And now we need to do the same exact kind of revolution and have the same realization in the CMS world, which is that just as you know, JavaScript developers back in the day said, hey, Node.js makes it super easy for us to just get rid of this arbitrary separation of concerns and put in a much more convenient experience for us. That's the same exact thing the CMS needs to do as well. And as Filip Barakowski said, uh, of uh, view storefront, now known as Alakai, is that modern tools are expected to have end-to-end -end ownership over the value they deliver, rather than ownership of a technical process. And this was in response to a post that I made on LinkedIn about the fact that we're seeing so much softness in the market for headless CMS. And the whole reason for that is because it's just part of the equation. Headless, fundamentally, is incomplete. And we need to think beyond headless and beyond some of these existing paradigms to think about what it is that the CMS should look like in the future. What does a CMS look like that works for everybody and not just one segment of the population? At .CMS, we're working on this uh, quite aggressively right now. We just launched earlier this year uh, what we call the Universal Visual Editor, which is a uh, visual editor that allows you to assemble and edit in place content across any presentation layer. And this means both our monolithic approach, uh, .CMS is a Java CMS, uh, so we use a templating language known as Velocity, uh, which is pretty much the same as Twig and as PHP template. Um, but the difference is that you use the same exact visual editor for your monolithic front end, your Java front end. You can use it for any headless framework that we have SDKs and support for. And also, you can edit pretty much anything that's also web renderable, which means if you have any sort of presentation layer, that's built using WebXR, for example, if you're using Babylon.js, for instance, to build out augmented reality overlays or virtual reality experiences. Those are all things that should also be editable within the CMS. And also we're working on uh, universal AI generation as well, universal infrastructure. I can talk more about that uh, at some point afterwards as well. So what we're seeing right now is this convergence, right, where the static web CMS originally was really great for content teams, really great for developer teams. As developer teams started to move away and started to understand that you know, they weren't really innovating in the ways that developers wanted to see, hence the headless or composable CMS. And then, of course, the hybrid headless generation, which is Drupal, all of us monolithic or traditional legacy folks, you know, as they like to call us, uh, we became more focused on the content use cases, the content teams. But we need to refocus through this evolution, through this convergent evolution that we're seeing on the notion of a CMS as being good for everybody and not just for one. As Dominic Pitev said, uh, we need to make people the center of CMS again, right? Because the fundamental issue of CMSs isn't so much the content. It's about the people. It's about how we collaborate. It's about how we work together. And it's about how we contribute together towards a really great solution for um, our end users and our customers at the end of the day. How many people in here, by the way, uh, use Drupal on a daily basis? Just out of curiosity. Okay, great. How many people have ever used a headless CMS in here? Has anyone tried Contentful or Sanity or any of those? Okay. One thing I would highly encourage uh, you know y'all to do, especially those of you who contribute to Drupal, um, is have a look at some of these CMSs that are out there and what they're doing. Sanity is doing some really interesting stuff. HiGraph also, uh, Contentful is starting to get a little behind, but also does some very interesting things as well. So, uh, but I want to talk through now exactly what these things look like, right? What does universal editing look like in a universal CMS? Here's the problem. The current state of visual editing is this, right? The current state is that in a pure headless CMS, you don't really have any site building. Components become black boxes that you can't introspect, right? In a hybrid headless CMS, however, where we control the entire presentation layer, like we do in Drupal or in WordPress or uh, you know, in other CMSs, we can actually visualize and see how components of a layout are meant to interact with each other 
in context, right? With a headless CMS, it's simply not possible. At least, it wasn't until recently. But here's the thing that the universal CMS goes towards, right? Is regardless of what you want to build in, regardless of whether it's Next.js or Vue.js or React or PHP or Laravel or what have you, you should be able to preview your content and visually assemble your content within the context of a visual editor. And this also extends to other channels as well. If you're building digital signage, for example, if you're building a WebXR interface, if you're building a static website or React Native application, or if you're building a voice interface or a chatbot using some sort of a, of a visual framework like Alexa Skills Kit or something of that nature, all of these things are things that you can preview and see within the CMS. When I was at Acquia uh, about seven or eight years ago, I was part of an amazing team, and we actually built out the first ever um, virtual reality editor within Drupal. It still exists. I believe you can still get it um, as a module. But basically, it allowed you to navigate through a virtual reality space, through an environment, and edit each of the pieces of content that were being delivered into that spatial uh, experience. So very, very interesting stuff. Uh, for .CMS, uh, we have a universal visual editor, as I mentioned. It straddles the CMS, and it also can handle any headless consumer that you can imagine, which really gets us to that goal of tech agnostic and multimodal. Currently, we have SDKs for a lot of different uh, frameworks. We have SDKs for React, uh, Vue.js, Angular, uh, you name it. We're going to come out with Astro later this year. And also next year, we'll be setting our sights on much further uh, out uh, technologies as well. Unfortunately, just before I started this presentation, uh, I worked my demo. So I will not be able to show a live demo uh, today. But if I can get it fixed, I can, I can show it to folks uh, after this session as well. But what does universal development mean? Now, shifting our attention away from content editors to uh, developers, right? Well, when it comes to development, I think today we have to acknowledge that many of the developers who are now entering boot camps, who are now entering university programs, are really never going to be touching, for example, PHP or Java, right? In many university programs today, especially in the East, you know, on the East Coast in the US, we're seeing a lot of folks just learn JavaScript, and that's pretty much it. Um, and that really means that we have to shift away from a lot of this mentality of, of uh, uh, you know, expecting that our developers will use Twig, will use PHP template. We have to be open to these possibilities of other technologies and other frameworks emerging. Many of you may remember that about seven or eight years ago, I led an initiative um, to experimentally adopt a JavaScript framework within Drupal. And uh, you know, we made a decision to look at React for that, to, to try things out and see where things go. But as we can see now today, the JavaScript framework landscape remains just as in just as much upheaval as it was back then. Um, and now we're exactly. And now we're going to see that you know all of the different frameworks that we have today need to be supported. Astro, Svelte, Angular, so on and so forth. But we also have to consider the fact, right, that now we're seeing a lot more effort in terms of web renderable technologies, opening up a huge amount of possibility for the CMS. Uh, how many people have uh, read or played with WebXR, the extended reality web? Wow, OK. Well, um, I wrote an article in Smashing Magazine about Babylon JS. Highly encourage everyone to, to take a look. WebXR is really cool, right? Because it's basically AR, VR, XR in the browser. Um, if you remember VRML from way back in the day, it's a lot better than VRML, let me tell you. Uh, then there's WASM, right? WebAssembly. Uh, how many people have played with WebAssembly yet? Here. OK, great. WebAssembly is really interesting, too, because it allows us to build very complex applications that can also be executed entirely within the browser. And finally, other frameworks that are out there, the compile to native or cross-platform frameworks, right? Like React Native and Flutter. These are also very, very important for uh, our developers today. But here's the thing. Developers need to start to think beyond the web as well, right? And this is why I bring up WebXR. This is why I bring up all of these other <laughs> non-web presentation layers. Digital signage, voice, native mobile apps, native tablet apps. These are all things that are still very much in early days uh, when it comes to CMSs. Pretty much every CMS at this point has JavaScript SDKs, you know, has a sense of, of how to build on a front end for a website. But nobody really yet has gotten into the realm of, OK, now how do I you know, build a VR experience and preview and edit that within 
the CMS application. So universal development really means that we need to focus on more than just the website, more than just web apps, and we're seeing this right now, right? A lot of folks are now coming back and saying, hey, we, yes, we have a great website now, we've got a great web CMS, but now we need to use that same CMS to administer content for a variety of different channels, regardless of where that content ends up. <laughs> Universal deployment is the same sort of idea, right? We know now that in many cases, content architectures are very complex, and content architectures also have to be hosted in multiple places, right? Multiple components going to multiple places. So for instance, uh, you know, if you have JavaScript or Web Renderable, you might be putting that over in an S3 bucket or using Amplify, you might be putting that on Cloudflare. Um, you might be using Netlify or Vercel, for example. Um, and of course, for static websites, you're still gonna use a lot of the platform as a service approaches that are out there, AWS, Pantheon, for example, Google Cloud, Azure, Aquia Cloud, so on and so forth. And finally, universal generation. So this is one of the things that I think is really important for the CMS to get right. I have a fear, and I think a lot of us in this room share that fear, that generative AI is an existential threat to the CMS. It is very possible that within the next five to 10 years, we might all be out of a job because people can generate their own CMSs, people can generate their own tools, people can build their own tools solely by prompting an AI. Now here's where we are today, right? Today where we are is we can generate text, assets, and in many cases, code as well, especially using co-pilots. But now what we're seeing is a lot of the newer players in the market, folks like Builder.io, are now starting to look at things that go well beyond the current Gen AI capabilities that we see. That means components, templates, entire layouts. Um, I saw a really interesting demo just a few weeks ago uh, from uh, the folks over at uh, Magnolia. Uh, and they're already doing full landing page generation, full layout generation using AI. Drupal is gonna get there too, uh, of course, and so will .cms, but you know, this is one of those big things. This is one of the big reasons why we're seeing so much investment and so much contribution in those AI projects in the Drupal ecosystem. But I do firmly believe that within the next three to five years, what we're gonna to start to see is entire websites being generated, entire landing pages being generated based on content within the CMS. But here's the thing. I also see the logical conclusion of this being full front ends, form generation, even bespoke CMS UIs, and even bespoke CMSs altogether. I can see a future eight to 10 years from now where the CMS as an entity no longer exists because we simply can just generate one without having to uh, build a CMS at all. So this existential threat is very, very crucial and is something that I think is, is um, dominating a lot of the conversation about CMS because it is worrying. <laughs> it is something that is a big, big uh, fear for a lot of us in the room as well. So universal CMS is really meant to move beyond this distinction, beyond this tired distinction of headless versus monolithic, of decoupled and coupled and all of that, because frankly, the world has evolved to the point where that distinction is no longer relevant and it's no longer helpful, right? Because headless CMSs aren't so headless anymore and monolithic CMSs aren't so monolithic anymore. Where we're headed is actually a convergence point, which I call universal CMS, and that's gonna be a huge inflection point that will change a lot of how we operate within the CMS and how we compete across the CMS market. But see, here's the thing that I wanna end with today, which is that one of the questions I wanted to pose with this presentation wasn't just about the future of the CMS, but about who we build CMSs for. Who is it that Drupal serves? Who is it that .CMS serves? Because at the end of the day, content is about people. It's not about the content. It's not about databases. It's not about SQL queries. It's not about modules. It's not about themes. It's not about Twig. It's about the people and enabling the people at the center of our content to do their best work, whether that's a developer, a content editor, an accessibility expert, or a designer. That's where we need to head, is towards an idea of a CMS as being less about architecture, less about purity, less about prescriptivism, and more about the people that we serve day in and day out. That's it, thank you very much, and I'll uh, stick around for questions. Got questions? <coughs> the 
So when you talk about a uh, CMS being technology agnostic, isn't what you're really talking about is building a million different CMSs and a million different technologies? It's a great question. Um, so what I what I mean actually is that you know you can have a CMS that's built in any technology, right? Uh, uh, Drupal is built in PHP. .CMS is built in Java, right? But the notion of tech agnosticism for me is more about the presentation layers, right? Uh, one of the things that we see quite often, actually, uh, and, and this is something I've seen many, many, many times over the last five to 10 years, is you have these large Fortune 500 organizations that are building enterprise level websites, but the problem is that each of their departments has, has a different framework, right? So for example, um, I worked with, a, did some architectural consulting for a Fortune 500 company out in Japan. Everyone's heard the name, uh, I can't name them. But this company had 12 different websites, three of which were on Drupal, two of which were on Angular, one of which was on React, another one that was on Vue.js, right? And they needed to figure out a way for their content editors not to have to understand or have to deal with this ridiculous distinction and leaky abstractions of the fact that Angular is different from Vue.js, right? Because that's immaterial to a content editor. A content editor, a marketing team should not have to care about the distinction between Angular and Vue.js and so on and so forth. So what I mean by tech agnostic is that, you know, a CMS in and of itself with its developer ecosystem should be able to serve any technology that is major and that is commonly used. Contentful, for example, has uh, SDKs across all of the JavaScript ecosystems, across all of the frameworks, but they also, interestingly, ha uh, have SDKs in Python and PHP and Java that allow you to work, and .NET, that allow you to work directly with Contentful in much the same way as uh, headless uh, CMS developers do with JavaScript. <clears throat> I've got a question, Preston, over here. Hey, hey. Uh, I think I'm gathering from your presentation that that term headless visual editing is a contradiction or <laughs> an oxymoron. Uh, when, when you hear that term, headless visual editing, where the visual editing is very much ahead, uh, when do you decide to argue with the person putting forth that term and tell, tell them that that's a contradiction? And when do you decide to say, oh, good idea, I think you are leading towards universal CMS? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Steve. Um, so, yeah, from, from, from my standpoint, um, I agree, it is an oxymoron, it makes no sense, it's a completely nonsensical term, headless visual editing. Unfortunately, you know, terms have a way of getting, you know, getting away from us, right? We spent many years trying to make sure that people start calling uh, a headless Drupal decoupled Drupal. Well, that didn't work. Now everyone just calls it headless, right? So, but the, from, from the standpoint of visual editing, right, what's really interesting is that they're still calling themselves headless but they're not purely headless anymore, right? It's impure headless. Um, in much the same way that you're seeing, uh, increasingly, I would say, uh, folks like Drupal and .CMS becoming less monolithic and becoming much more open to the sort of headless world. Um, what I would say is that at some point, I'm not sure exactly where, and that's pretty much up for, you know, up for, up for, up for yeah, I think. So. Like, like, at what point, do those CM can those CMSs no longer call themselves headless, right? Because they are, they because they, they simply are not with the visual editing capabilities. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Time will tell. Over here. Um, hey. Over a decade ago, when, uh, when RDF module was integr uh, integrated into Drupal core, uh, Dries, which are uh, referred to it as food for robots. Um, the idea being that if we make our content understandable by search engines and things, that uh, they can just rehash it as needed. And if it, you know, if, if as you say, the day is coming when AIs can assemble and reassemble content for us, why do we even need CMSs in the future? That's exactly the question that I posed at the end. Um, there is a lot of anxiety, I would say. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of people are talking about it because because of the fact that it is an existential threat. But um, you know, I think that this is why I believe that where the CMS needs to evolve, in order to get to the point where we're better than any CMS that could be generated by an AI, right, is to introduce AI use cases that are very compelling. 
Um, I find Builder.io's approach, for example, very interesting. What they've done is they've created an AI pipeline that using a Figma design system, a Figma prototype, it can generate basically an entire um, uh, application for you uh, based on that design. And, and that has full CMS integration, full content editing capabilities all built in. Um, I think where we need to move personally is to the point where you know we're not just talking about just content generation. I think content generation is so last year, right? Uh, at this point, pretty much every major CMS you can generate text, you can generate an image, you know, you can do mid journey, you can do you know doll, you can do all of it, right? But the thing that is the real holy grail for me isn't so much content generation, so much as it is presentation layer generation, landing page generation, microsite generation, right? That is, I think, the point at which the CMS becomes something that is no longer really a CMS, but is really more about a web publishing environment that can do a lot of really, really interesting things. I also see form generation as being a big use case. I think there's a lot of people in the CMS world working on that right now, looking at you know how can we take, for example, a content model and generate a form that we can you know have our editors use, right? Um, all of those sorts of use cases to me are much more interesting than you know generating an image or a video or a paragraph of text uh, because that's where the CMS becomes truly more useful than just administering content, just managing content, and becomes something that really is no longer a CMS. It's really a presentation, a, a I don't like to use this term, but like a digital experience management system, right? So. <laughs> Thanks, Preston. This is great. I was curious about how this might work in your mind in terms of like Fortune 500 companies or government organizations or you know large universities that are required to have their content be on their site and they have to follow these legal restrictions. So how does this sort of thing fit within those current legal requirements for some of these organizations to maintain content on the web. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I think there's several dimensions to uh, this issue, right? Uh, the first is compliance. Um, also, you've got the issue of uh, content and data sovereignty, right, which are also important. A lot of folks, you know, I know a lot of higher ed folks uh, still do uh, uh, on-premise hosting, uh, for instance. Um, and then there's AI as well, right? So uh, a few years ago, about seven years ago, I worked with the state of Georgia uh, to build out a, a first ever Alexa interface that served out georgia.gov content out to the Alexa device. But the problem is, just to start with AI, right? The problem with AI is that hallucinations are still very likely. And you know, it, it, in many cases, these are life or death things, right? If you, for example, need to ha have a question answered about financial aid, right? or if you need to have a question answered about mental health services at a university, and the AI delivers some sort of wrong response, that is, that is a big deal, right? That is a big problem. So I certainly think that AI is gonna be very, very slow to enter some of these environments, especially around higher ed, financial services, so on and so forth. Um, but I think one of the things that we do see is increasingly, you know, I just uh, spoke a few weeks ago with, um, uh, a uh, uh, web strategist over at McGill University. And one of the things that they're doing is focusing on delivering that content to many, many, many different channels, right? A mobile app, a tablet, um, signs that are around campus, for instance. Um, so for that, I do think that this sort of universal CMS approach is gonna be very relevant very, very quickly here. Uh, because, you know, as we know, it's, it's a nightmare to manage content for, let's say, campus digital signs or, or campus uh, kiosks and that sort of thing, while also keeping all of that content current and also relevant and also based on the content that you find on the website as well. But, but AI, I see, is as definitely not coming anytime soon. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, with a lot of these newer channels emerging, compliance is going to become a big issue. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's say that you know we've got a very clear sense of what that looks like on the website. You can go to the CMS, you can look at you know various things, you can you can make sure that your site is compliant. But what does that look like when you start to move into some of these other channels, right? When you start to move into a mobile app, for example, you know people still need to be able to evaluate that compliance within the same system. It's really complicated and very very time consuming to force somebody who's just looking at making sure that a digital property is compliant 
having to jump through all these hoops to access all of those different previews of those experiences. Um, why not just put that all in the same CMS? We have time for one more question. <laughs> Everyone. Yes. Here it is. <coughs> I'm just wondering how this works with accessibility issues. Like, for example, one, one of the biggest hassles with accessibility is uh, doing uh, screen reader checks. And I'm wondering, is there a way to have, like, you know, these sites, you know, when you're 